Before I go any further, these red spots on my head are cancers where they were taken out and the one over here, they took it all the way down to my skull like a hole punch and it's filling back in. So if you're looking at me out there all over the world wondering what's wrong with my face, that's what's wrong with my face. I've got realigned a little bit here and uh, that's what to call a, a facelift type, except mine was a modification. <laughs> anyway, we have been studying church history. Our first message on church history today is about the Bible again. Because we didn't really look at everything. The Bible is a magnificent book. Now, we know that Abraham, God called out Abraham, and we talked about the three races, which we're going to go into more in depth with that. But we have Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah. Every intricate detail in the Bible is extremely important. We have people, even in this valley, we have people that are atheists. And they don't believe that the Bible is a, is a book of uh, a man's uh, compilation and that it, uh, it, it's as crazy. It, it, it's written by man and not of God. But the Bible is so intricate. Now, do you remember how many books are in the Bible? How many books are in the Bible that we have printed? How many? 39 in the Old and 27 in the New. That's right, 66 books all together. 39 books in the Old Testament and, and 27 in the New Testament. It is a library. But even the words in the Bible mean something. You take the first 10 names in the Bible, Adam, Zeth, etc., etc., all the way down to Noah. All of those names teach something. Every name. Remember, Abram meant exalted father. And Sarah meant uh, contentious. But it also means prince because princes get to be princes because they're what? They fight. So it means to fight. Now, in Hebrew, there are Aleph, Beth, Kamel, Daleth. All right? He. Aleph, Beth, Gamel, Daleth, He. That's the fifth letter, okay? Now, in the Bible, even the numbers mean something in the Bible, don't they? Do they or not? Mm -hmm. What we call biblical numerology, right over there... Someplace there's a book on biblical numerology up here. And every number in the Bible means something. The number one means unity, doesn't it? Number two means uh, division, because you have two. And three, that has got to do with the tri triune God the divine trinity of all things. The divine trinity of all things. Man is made up of three things. Body. Body. Sarks. Basar. Sarks in Greek. Basar in Hebrew. The soul. Psyche in Greek. And Nephish in Hebrew. And what else? Spirit. Huh? Spirit. Spirit. The spirit, word spirit in the Hebrew is Ruah, and in the New Testament it is Numa, where we get pneumatics from that word. Man is triune like God is triune. The angels are triune, are they not? Okay? They, are, they have bodies. Now, I mean, there are people out there that are going to disagree with what I'm saying. But they need to get back to the Bible. That's all I can say. Angels have form, don't they? Angels have form. There are they are they have form body, and they have spirit, 
and they have souls, don't they? Mm -hmm. Now, did God make the angels in His image also? Everything in this world has ever been created declares God in some way. Everything. The angels are supernatural, aren't they? God is supernatural. A man is uh, made in the image of God directly, Genesis 1.26. Man is triune in God's uh, spiritual image and his uh, blood flowing likeness like the Son of God and his, his uh, sovereign likeness like the soul of God, so to speak. Now, let's look at God for a moment and just bringing what we call a condescension. A condescension means you're bringing something high down to low, so you can understand it. God uh, <clears throat> reveals himself to us in a condescending way, so we can understand him. Now, <clears throat> we are in a, what we might call, an electronic age today, aren't we? Whether we like it or not. <laughs> People will get me on the phone, well, just go do this. I said, I don't know how to do that. Oh, okay. Well, you can learn. I said, I don't know how to do that. I don't have that capability. Okay, if I don't know how to do it, then I don't have the capability. Okay? I may even have some of the tools, but I don't know how to use them. Man is a spirit, he is soul, and he is physical body. Now let's look at God for a minute. Look at your computer, and your phone is a computer, okay? The phone, right here, this is what we call what? Material. Material. Hardware. Hardware. It's hardware. You can see it and touch it, can't you? All right. So hardware is like Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God, in, God brought himself into, out. It says in John 1, 14, Kai And the word of Jehovah became flesh, and he dwelled among us. We beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In John 1, 18, it says, No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God, the one now that we can see, okay? The only begotten God, the one being in the bosom of the Father, that one has led himself out. So we know that the hardware of God is Jesus Christ, okay? He's a Hamashiach. He is our kinsman redeemer. He is our Goel in Hebrew. Goel means kinsman redeemer. God to redeem us had to be related to us. So he condescended and came down to this earth and became flesh and blood like you and me. So there is the hardware. Now, we have um, in every computer in that phone, how long will that phone run without energy? Not forever. So the energy in that is spirit. That's the electricity that energizes that. Okay? Now, how about software? Software. Software is what makes it run. So you have the energy that energizes it. You've got hardware so you can do something with it. I mean, you can't do anything with the hardware. But then the hardware won't work even though if you got energy unless you got software. And that's the Father, the software. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now that's as simple as I can make it. God, in the triune God, now that computer has to have three things to make it work, doesn't it? Well, you got to have three things. You'd be surprised how many things are triune. Three. And then number four, and then the one that we're coming down to is number five, which is grace. Grace. Five is the number of grace. Now, God called Abraham out by grace, didn't he? We talked last week that he was a, uh, what we call a fragile vessel that Abraham had all of the tendencies that we have to uh, not trust in God when we're scared. It should make us trust in God more. But God told Abraham to go into Canaan, and he went to Canaan, and then he, it, there was a famine in the land, so he went where? Egypt. 
Egypto's Mitzrayim. He went down there and he got down there and got in trouble, didn't he? And he went down there and became a used wife salesman. And we sold his wife to Sarah to Pharaoh. And this is the woman now, through her womb, the Messiah child will come. God told him that. But he's, what is he doing? He's, um, I would say that he's very much uh, tempting God in all reality. But God made a promise to him and the promise is on God. Salvation is by grace. It has nothing to do with us, period, at all. Nothing. All we do is ask God to forgive us. He does, he does all the rest. He gives us the faith later on. Ephesians 2 and 8 says, For in grace you are having been saved through faith, and the faith didn't come from you. It come from God. Faith, you don't even have faith to believe. That comes from God. The only thing you do is surrender. Surrender. Number five is number grace. In Abraham's name, God added a hey or an H. The number of grace. Abraham, exalted father of a multitude. And Sarah, Sarah from Sarai. Sarah, the fifth word in the Hebrew alphabet, grace. We could go through all of the numbers of Scripture. And we could go 40 and 50, 60, whatever you want to do. Every one of them means something. So the Bible is an intricate book. You can take out one word sometimes. I, I preached on John 1, 1, John 1, 14, John 1, 18, and one of my friends, Larry Crouch, uh, Dr. Larry Crouch, actually, we went to school together, and, we, and I, I was the substitute teacher in Greek, and Larry didn't have a Bible one time. And I was always in old bookstores looking around. That's where I got all these old books, see. And I had found a Westcott and Hort Bible, and Brother Herbert said, uh, get Westcott and Hort or Nestle Allen. Don't mess around with this, uh, these other texts, especially Texas Receptus. Anyway, so Larry didn't have a Greek Bible to read from. And I bought this Bible, but it had a really rough cover on it. And I put a leather cover on it and nailed it and glued it all together with, with, with a contact cement. And I just went by his desk and I just set it down and didn't say nothing to set that on there. He remembers that to this day. He, I provided a Bible for him. I hadn't given but just a little bit. It cost me more for the leather and the glue than it did for the Bible. Nobody could read Greek anyway, so those books went real cheap. <laughs> Anyway, Larry got on the website and looked at those verses. Then he called me on the phone from the seminary in Fresno, California one day, out there when I lived in Old River. You remember that, Maryland? Mm -hmm. And he said, Brother Phillips, he said, I want you to explain John 1, 1, 114, and 118 for this class. So I'm on the phone, so I explain John 1, 1, 114, 118. And then he said he went back to his church and preached one Sunday on John 1, 1, one church, Sunday on John 1, 14, and one Sunday on John 1, 18. And he said the lessons were full because there's so much there in every verse. We see all of that. The Bible is an extremely uh, delicate. It is a very powerful book, and it's a very enduring book. Let's look at the history of the Bible for a minute. If I threw that chart up there, we find out that the Catholic Church banned the Bible. Did you know that? The Catholic Church banned the Bible. Anybody to have the Bible. First of all, they banned anybody to have the Bible in any language but, but Latin. Because the people didn't read Latin, so if they had the Bible, what they were teaching was not going to be exposed because they couldn't read Latin. But the best thing to do is just keep them from having a Bible altogether, so they finally banned the Bible completely. If you, if you had a page of the Bible, they would take you out and burn you at the stake or behead you or crucify you or impale you or gut you alive. They did all of these things. I can show you pictures and illustrations of what they did in different times and different places. 
Now, the people that were holding on to the Bible were called Baptists. They weren't always called Baptists. They were called Paulicians. They were called Donatists, Montanists, uh, Peter Toffers, whatever. And they, their pastors had to memorize four books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the Psalms in the original languages. And have you ever heard of them burning witches? The burning of the witches, and we talk about the... Uh, the Inquisition. These people that they burned were Baptists, that, but the Baptists were witches because they could read and write. And most of the Baptist pastors were doctors. They were there because Baptist, uh, Baptist congregations hid out. And so the pastor was their physician and he was their leader and their preacher, pastor. All in one. So if they caught a church member, they would torture the church member until they told them who the deacons and the pastor were. And they were, if they would, many times they did not, but if they did, they would take them out and burn them at stake. And this happened thousands and thousands of times. The Bible was forbidden. Now, we have, let me just throw this thing up here quickly so you can see what I'm talking about. Only take a moment for me to turn around and put this chart up. Because to talk about the Bible, we must do this. Now here, we have the church of the Lord Jesus Christ as they existed from the beginning. The churches had no buildings. The churches were congregations they met in people's houses or out in the woods or in a cave or someplace. Because being a Christian was, most of the time, illegal in the Roman Empire, and it was illegal uh, when, the power, when the Jews were in power. Well, we get up to about, we have different heresies coming into the church, so the Catholic Church did not begin until 325 A.D. approximately. It began with a church in the state here with Constantine. When Constantine uh, wanted to take over the Roman Empire, he basically killed his brother. And he said that the night before they went into battle, they were going to have this battle right on this bridge. <clears throat> and, uh, and he said, God appeared and put a fiery cross in the sky. And he said, by this conquer. I'm going to tell you something. Christianity is not a Christianity of the sword. Never has been. It is not a religion of what we might call conquest. Only with the word of God they preached. Well, he met his brother the next day. He killed his brother and threw his body in the river and it floated on down the river. And from then on, he said, well, now this will be a real good way. Everybody in my offices under my reign, they're going to become Christians. They're going to become Christians. We're going to call them Catholics. Catholic means universal. The Catholic Church, the universal church, the head of that church was Constantine, and he declared himself, and the, and the Council of Nicaea declared that he was uh, an apostle of God. So what he said went. Now, if you want to have the Catholic Church have a pope, it sure wasn't Peter. Because Peter wouldn't have anything to do with the Catholic Church. The first person that was pope was not even Constantine. The first pope didn't come up until later on when they have the first pope way over yonder. Leo the second. But in all reality, as the office of the Pope, Constantine was. So he decided what all people would believe. He got all his pastors there in the Council of Nicaea. He gathered them together, but the Baptists would not go. Because they weren't going to let anybody tell them what to do. The Bible always already is still our rule book of faith and practice, okay? 
They weren't going to let any empire. Well, Constantine married the church to the state, and this is 325 A.D., basically. And in that, they said, when you're born into this world, you're going to be baptized, okay? And you're going to become a member of the church, and you're going to become a member of the state. Same time. Now, even when the Protestants came out of the Catholic Church, they had the same idea, Luther and Calvin had the same idea of church and state. So they established church states. John Calvin, the Presbyterian Church, and Luther and Germany. Now, there were plenty of Baptists in Germany, they called them Wiedertoppers. Now, when Luther was setting up his... Uh, what we might call revolt against the Catholic Church, and they tried to reform the Catholic Church. They did not want to leave the Catholic Church. But here the Catholic Church began over here now, and it's way over here, and Luther and Calvin both read the Bible and preached the Bible. Luther was an ordained Catholic priest. Calvin was a Catholic priest, but he was not ordained. But he was a Catholic priest. He preached in the Dominican churches. Both of them had the idea of church and state, and they wanted to regulate morality and Christianity among all people, and everybody had to go to church by mandate, okay? By mandate. They mandated that you get married in the church with a certificate, like the Catholic Church did, and that you died, and you got a certificate, and you were buried in a church churchyard, uh, to honor you as one of the followers of this church. <clears throat> Calvin and Luther, and during this period of time, they had great orchestras in churches. Orchestras. Orchestras and concerts. There's where we have the Hallelujah concert and all this kind of stuff. The Baptist would not have instruments in their church at all because they had these great big orchestras. And so, here these rascals are doing that, so we're not going to do that, so we're going to run plumb on the other side of the pasture over here, and we're not going to have any instruments in the church at all. Now, there's no foundation for that except that they were making a statement. Because we find out that all the songs in the Bible were accompanied with singing. Almost all the songs are singing, and they sang with instruments also. But they took a stand. Because the church was supported by the state and everybody paid taxes. Today in Germany, if you get married in the Lutheran church, they take your tithe out of your paycheck. In America, when America was founded in the colonies, in the American colonies, you had a state church and everyone, you couldn't have any other church but that church, and you had to pay tithes to that church in America. Did you know that? Not until Rhode Island, Dr. John Clark and Roger Miller, did we have a freedom of religion in the colony of Rhode Island. They had two churches there. We'll go into that later. Now the Bible is a full rule of faith of the Baptist. Well, the Catholic Church, Constantine had 350 uh, three. Uh, had 50 Bibles printed in Uncials, a whole complete Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And they canonized the books. And I don't have a lot of disagreement with what they canonized at all. They did a pretty good job on that. There are other books in the Bible that were mentioned. The Book of Enoch, the Book of Jasher. And... Uh, they're referred to and quoted many, many times in the Bible. It doesn't mean that those books were totally, in every way, uh, inspired of God. The Bible is inspired to books, Genesis through Revelation. Now, we establish the church and the church in the say. All right? And the Bible is being compiled and the Bible is being twisted up all at the same time during this period of time. It's, it's being dismantled, it's being, uh, they, originally the Bible was, in the Old Testament, was written in Hebrew. In the Hebrew Bible, 
the Hebrew Bible is inspired of God. The Greek New Testament is inspired of God, and any translations of thereof are not inspired, but we use them. That's why all of my life I've taught from Greek and Hebrew, basically. Because that's the standard. That's the standard. That's the standard by which everything else is judged. You can look at King James, you can look at New American Standard, New Amplified Bible, the International Bible, you can look at all of those, but the standard of all of those, and they even say that in the later translations, is the Greek and the Hebrew text. And in uh, <coughs> Spiral Zotis, uh, Greek Hebrew Bible, study Bible, he has numbers there from Strong's Concordance, and they go back. I don't go to Strong's. I go to Brown, Driver, and Briggs, Kohler, and Bumgardner. I go to Thayer. I, I go to the analytical lexicons and whatever. Both in the Geddon. The originals. There's nothing wrong with going to the Strong's numbers, but you only get what Strong says. If you go to the original, you get all the story. Okay? You get the whole, the rest of the picture. I know this is probably complicated for you in a lot of ways. Now, now where I'm going with the Bible is that the Bible has been attacked by Satan through churches. Terribly. Terribly through churches. The Catholic Church established the church and they would use the Bible. But they said uh, Maximus Pontin, Pontinus Maximus, Pontinus Maximus, which became the title of the Pope later, that Constantine had the right to say what's there and what isn't there. Because the church, of course, made him the Pontifus Maximus, the, the ultimate authority, the apostle of God, so to speak. And then they translated the, the Bible into Latin. There in Bethlehem. They translated the Bible into Latin. And by that time, the Catholic Church was veering greatly from what the Scripture said. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the Bible out of the hands of the people so they won't know what we're teaching is wrong. The instruction manual from God is the Bible. So they translated it into Latin. Now, right up here, at this period of time, about 570 A.D., there's a character, uh, according to history, some histories, and some sources, that was born. His name was Muhammad. Now, Muhammad uh, evidently had epilepsy, according to many authorities. His mother died very young, probably with epilepsy also. Now all people now, the Catholic, or the, not the Catholic, but the Muslims have all excuses for all this, but if you look up there on that top shelf and come down on the second shelf there, that whole top shelf is nothing but Islamic writings. And there's one book up there called uh, The Life of Muhammad by Ibn Ishik. That's written about 200 years after Muhammad was supposed to have been born. But Muhammad, uh, supposedly, when he was there in Mecca, there's two different messages of Muhammad, one in Mecca and one in Medina. And they're diametrically opposed. I want you to understand that. The two messages that Muhammad got from Allah, supposedly, are diametrically opposed. The message that he got in, in Mecca was a, 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 uh, Islam is a peaceful religion. There is no compulsory we're not going to compel you to be a Muslim. That's what they say today. Isn't it? That's hogwash. Because that has been nullified. It's been abrogated. It's been replaced. Well, he tried to get out there, and, and what happened to Muhammad now, this is a lot of history. Muhammad uh, supposedly lived in Mecca, but if you look at Mecca, and you take the descriptions in the Quran and in the life of Muhammad 
It's not describing Mecca. It's describing some other place. Because there are no palm trees there. It's an absolute desert. There is no great mountains there with, with uh, streams and things running down there. It just isn't Mecca. Many people believe the Mecca of Muhammad was uh, Petra. Where there all where there was all of those things. It was like a metropolis like New York City and a trade center of the way of the day. Mecca during this period of time was nothing. But let's get back to what it teaches. I just wanted to throw that one in for, for a little extra. You got that for free. Now in fact you're getting all this for free. <laughs> anyway, he was born in 578. The Catholic Church had already Let's look at what the Catholic Church was teaching when he came along. This is the world that Muhammad was born in, okay? We have a church and state by Constantine already established, don't we? We already have a pope over here. We had Constantine, the church began called the Catholic Church. Infant, infant baptism is established by law. Baptismal regeneration is established by law in the Catholic Church. Okay? And forced conversion is established by law by Constantine. They would go into cities where they'd go in to conquer, and they'd go into these cities, and they would take them out to a stream. By the way, there was only one form of baptism, and that was immersion. They took them out to the rivers, and... Uh, they would put a sword to their throat. And they'd say, will you convert from your pagan ways into the church Catholic or else your head can be floating down the creek and your body in separate directions. And of course, most of them converted. But they were still pagans, weren't they? They only converted because they had to convert to stay alive. Well, they went from city to city doing this and, and they were all being converted. And then we have uh, the church and the state. We have a persecution act. We have the tolerance act there where they would tolerate other churches. They would tolerate Christianity under Constantine. Pope Leo is established as pope. We have empty Baptist baptism established by law. And then we have more Mariolatry in 400 and. 31 A.D. Mariolatry. And that's the worship of Mary. Now the worship of Mary will escalate. She would finally become the mother of God and she would finally become uh, that she was a uh, uh, sinless, born sinless, a state sinless all her life, immaculate conducted, and then that she was uh, uh, she went up to heaven without dying. These are all, this all lies by the way. It's all lies. She had several children besides Jesus. But they had all of their half-children, half-brothers and half-sisters. They weren't married. Mary was a perpetual virgin, all this kind of baloney. Well, Mariolatry. Well, according to the, uh, wherever Mecca was, there was a Kaaba. And there was 360-something gods in the Kaaba, but one of them was Jesus and Mary. And if you go back and you, and you talk about the worship of the Madonna and child, it goes all the way back to Nimrod in the Tower of Babel. Now, by 623 A.D., pretty much Muhammad declared war on the world. The greatest library in the world was in Alexandria, Egypt, wasn't it? The Muslims went in there and said that there is nothing more important than, than the Quran. Of course, the Quran hadn't even been established yet, but they quoted it orally, supposedly, and how accurate it was. Uh, I can tell you something, you tell somebody else something, you tell somebody else something, it changes, doesn't it? Well, the Arabs say that they have superior memory of all of the people. Well, people are people. Okay. Anyway, they burned up the whole Alexandrian library and they burned every Bible they could find. And then the Catholic Church starts burning every Bible they can find. 
What do you think about that now? Here we have God's Word, and now the Catholic Church takes it out of the original language, puts it in Latin where no one can read it, and most of the priests are illiterate too, by the way. They're just learning all this stuff by rote, by memory. We have the, the Muslims, and we have the Catholic Church trying to totally destroy the Bible. The Inquisition. The Bible is absolutely, completely forbidden in any form in 1229 A.D. And still, we have a Bible. How did that happen? How do we have a Bible when all of these religions are trying to destroy the Bible? That's a miracle, isn't it? The, Bi the, book, of Bi the book, the Bible, is full of miracles, and so is the history of the Bible is full of miracles. Now remember, when you interpret the Bible, it's not a Ouija board. You don't so open it up and start reading the verse, and that's what you're supposed to get. You interpret the Bible by how it's written, just like you would any history book. Who's speaking? To whom is he speaking, and what is the subject? That's real simple, isn't it? You can go into five ways, who, what, where, when, and why. But who's speaking, to whom he's speaking, and about what is the subject? It's a very important interpretation of God's Word. That's what we call biblical hermeneutics. Biblical hermeneutics or Bible analysis. The key to the Bible is to let it talk to you. Don't try to make it say what you want it to say. You let it say what it says. People from the very time that I start preaching, they said it's so easy for you. Well, I just studied the Bible and I just let it fly. <laughs> That's it. That's the whole story. The Bible takes care of it. The Bible, in the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible, Moses wrote. The oldest book in the Bible is what? The book of Job. Okay. The Bible tells us about all kinds in the Old Testament. It's history telling us. And in the Old Testament, we have Psalms. The Psalms are a song book. They're a song book. But there are also doctrine in there. There's also prophecy in the Psalms. And then we have the prophets. The prophets were given a special message telling us what God wanted us to do at that period of time in history. Mainly it's written to uh, the ten tribes, Israel and Judah. And then... John the Baptist came along preaching. John the Baptist, uh, he wasn't a Baptist preacher, so to speak. We didn't get that title till later. But John the Dipper is what his name was. John the Dunker, John the Immerser. The word, uh, there's a one whole book there written on Bob Teasel, that one right there. A whole book, about 500 pages. We have the word Bob Tezo. Now, Marilyn, what does Bob Tezo mean? What does Bob Tezo mean? Freckles. Huh? Freckles. No, no, Bob Tezo. Bob Tezo, it, the Latin equivalent is mergio. That means to immerse. Oh, okay. Okay, so John was an immerser. He, he didn't sprinkle people. He did not uh, pour water on them as you see in some of the movies. John dipped them, that's why they call him John the okay. Baptist. John the Dipper. Mm -hmm. If you look up in some of these books up here, mine, where they translated them, they say John the Dipper. John the Immerser. He wasn't, he wasn't aligned with the Baptist faith, even though the Baptist faith is what he teaches, what he teaches, okay? And then if you wanted to sprinkle somebody, what would that be, Mary? Yep, what? Yep, no. I got them all mixed Boy, up. Oh, you got them mixed up today. Okay, now what does that say, Marilyn? What is? Ron Tizo. Oh. Ron Tizo means to sprinkle. Okay, now what does that mean? Hmm? That's one you told me a minute ago. Nipto. Nipto. That means to pour. Now, John was not uh, John the Nipto. He was not John the uh, Rontizo, but he was John the Baptizo, the Baptist. 
the dipper. He didn't sprinkle people. He did not pour water upon them. He dipped them. And he preached Baptist. Now, Jesus said, the law and the prophets were until John. After that, the kingdom of God is preached. The whole Old Testament was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Right then. He came. The Messiah came, Genesis 3.15. All of the promises of the Messiah were enacted in the person of Jesus Christ. Period. Then we have the writing of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts is the history of what Jesus did and how he established his churches. The epistles, like Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Ephesians, Colossians, all of the rest of the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, the book of James, 1 and 2 Peter, Jude, all these books deal with different problems in churches, different doctrines. There are doctrinal letters to tell you how to act in the house of God. Simple as that. Now that's the Bible. Now you can teach the Bible forever. You're not going to run out of soul at all. You're not going to run out of something to say if you preach the Bible. If you're preaching stories and uh, uh, what we call a prosperity gospel, you have to get up these messages that make people feel real good and feel like they can get rich tomorrow. They can name it and claim it. That is not the gospel, people. That is the false gospel. What they're wanting to name and claim is what every Adamic person wants. They're all physical things in the world. What we really need to name and claim is salvation in Jesus Christ. And then what I told you last week, you can take it with you. Everything you do for the Lord, you will take with you. Everything you do for yourself, you're going to leave behind. As simple as that. And all these little stories are written down in the book, the Bible. Father, thank you for your word today. And we talked about it a lot. Father, please use it throughout the world, wherever it goes, and help it to glorify you and your Son. And help us to realize that we're fragile, or we're finite, and you're infinite, and you're all-powerful. And how that you've protected your Bible. It just surprises me, Father, so much that all these religions try to destroy your Word or pervert your Word. And yet, from the original manuscripts, from the old manuscripts, there, you can stack one on another all over a mile high. That's something, Father, you took care of your word. Please continue to do that. Please forgive me where I fail you. In Jesus' name I pray.